Father, we're thankful for this beautiful day, as Alvin said, and as Neil said. We pray, Father, that you would be with us as we worship you, both in truth and in spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Father. Allow us to understand the things that you've written for our understanding, our learning, and then use. Let us leave this place changed, not just for the moment, but for the day, for the week, perhaps for the year going forward, and allow our light shine to others and with whom we come into contact. As through Christ we pray, amen. <clears throat> so if you remember a long time ago, I used to come up with just one word message titles. And I think it was Justin's suggestion saying, Dad, if you put in a few more words, it's a little easier to search, you know, if people wanted to search. So I got really creative with this one, and it's called Rack Rack with Debt. And if you'll follow me, you'll understand in just a moment. But the text of the message is taken from Romans chapter 3, verses 24 through 25. So if you'll turn your Bibles there. And then I also want to welcome Ryan and Jordan visiting us, actually visiting their dad and grandfather Doyle from Australia. It's good to have you here. We hope you enjoy your stay. Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. All need to be made right with God by His grace, which is a free gift. They need to be made free from sin through Jesus Christ. God gave Him as a way to forgive sin through faith, in the blood of Jesus. So this next slide, do you remember the days when credit cards were imprinted by hand? Do you remember that? You know, the clerk would take your plastic and place it in this, what they called a click-clack machine, and rack, rack, the numbers would be registered and the purchase would be made. I learned how to operate, again, what they called it, a knuckle buster, <laughs> at Sears when I worked in the sporting goods department. And for about a dollar an hour, I sold all sorts of sporting goods. But I think my favorite task was imprinting customers' credit card charges with this machine. And then usually they were using a, a Sears credit card. So you can tell how old I am. Sears no longer exists, and neither do these machines. So that's how old I am. You know, you get the millennials and the Gen Xers, and they're thinking, what? What are you talking about? But at least for the vast majority of the audience here, you understand. So my favorite task was taking their card, the Sears card, and then putting it in this machine. And there was nothing like this surge of power when you run this zip-zap machine over the plastic. And in my, I guess, teenage years, I would usually steal a glance at the customer and watch them wince as I rack racked their credit card purchase. Now, credit card purchases today aren't nearly as dramatic. I mean, nowadays the card is swiped, it's tapped, it's inserted in a slot, there's no noise, there's no drama, there's no pain. I mean, now you can even use your iPhone or your Android and make credit card purchases. But for me, bringing back that rick rack days when purchases were announced for everyone to hear. Oh, I see, buying some sporting goods, rack rack. Oh, you, charging some clothes, rack rack. Oh, paying for dinner, sure, rack rack. If the noise didn't get you, the statement at the end of the month generally would. 30 days is ample time to rack up enough purchases to really rack your budget at the end of the month. And a lifetime is plenty of time to rack up some major debt in heaven. You yell at your kids, rack, rack. You covet your friend's car, rack, rack. You envy your neighbor's success, rack, rack. You break a promise, rack, rack. You lie, rack, rack. Rack, 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 rack. Further and further and further in debt. Now, initially, we attempt to repay what we owe, don't we? 
So every prayer is like a check written, and each good deed is then a payment made. And if we can do one good act for every bad act, then our account is kind of in balance at the end, right? If I can counter my cussing with compliments, if I can counter my vices with virtues, then, I don't know, won't my account be justified? It would, except for two problems. The first is, I don't know the cost of each sin. You know, the price of a baseball at Sears, I could tell you what the price was. But the cost of a sin? I mean, not so much. Because what, for example, is the charge for getting mad in traffic? So I get ticked off at some guy who has cut me off. What do I do to pay for my crime? Do I drive 50 in a 55 mile an hour zone? Do I give a wave and a smile to 10 consecutive drivers after that incident to pay it? Who knows? Or what if I wake up and I'm in a bad mood? What's the charge for a couple of mopey hours? Will one church service like this morning make up for that? Will it offset one grumpy Monday? And what qualifies as a bad mood? Is the charge for grumpiness less on cloudy days than on sunny days? Or am I permitted a certain number of grumpy days, kind of like sick leave? You know, you just don't know because it gets really confusing. And not only do I not know the cost of my sins, I don't always know the occasion for my sins. Because there are times when I sin and I, I don't know it. How do I pay for those? Do I get an exemption based upon ignorance? And what about the sins I'm committing now without realizing it? What if somebody somewhere discovers that it's a sin to play golf? What if God thinks the way I play golf is a sin? Then I have a lot of making up to do. And what about you? Any sins of omission on this month's statement? Did you miss a chance to do good and not do it? Did you overlook an opportunity to forgive someone and turn the other way? Did you neglect an open door to serve someone? Did you seize every chance you had to encourage your friends? It's like rack, 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 rack. And there are other concerns, too. The grace period, for example. Now, my credit card allows for a minimal payment and then rolls the debt into the next month. Well, does God do the same thing? Will he let me pay off today's greed, I don't know, sometime next year? And what about interest? If I leave sin on my statement for several months, does it incur more sin? And speaking of the statement, where is it? Can I see it? Who, who has it? How do I pay it off? That's the question, isn't it? How do I deal with the debt that I owe to God? Do I deny it? Well, my conscience is not going to let me just completely deny it find worse sins in others to justify my own well God's not going to fall for that one either family pride that's not going to help can I try and pay it off I could but then that takes us back to our problem we don't know the cost of our sin in fact we don't even know how much we owe. So what do we do? 
Listen to Paul's answer. Romans chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. All need to be made right with God by His grace, which is a free gift. They need to be made free from sin through Jesus Christ. God gave Him as a way to forgive sin through faith in the blood of Jesus. You see, church, simply put, your sin is more than you can afford to pay. The gift of your God is more than you can even imagine. Continuing in Romans chapter 3, verse 28, Paul says, A person is made right with God through faith, not through obeying the law. And that might very well be the most difficult spiritual truth for a lot of us to embrace. For some reason, people accept Jesus as Lord before they'll ever accept Him as Savior. It's easier to comprehend His power than sometimes His mercy. We'll celebrate the empty tomb long before we'll ever kneel at the cross. We, a lot like Thomas, would die for Christ before we'd let Christ die for us. We aren't alone. We aren't the first to struggle with Paul's presentation of grace because apparently the first ones to doubt the epistle to the Romans were the first ones to read it. In fact, you get the distinct impression that Paul really expected these questions and it's like Paul was lifting his pen and thinking and considering his readers and he sees some of them squirming, some of them doubting, and some of them probably even denying. And so anticipating their thoughts, he deals with their objections head on. The first objection comes from the pragmatist. Do we destroy the law? By following the way of faith, Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verse 31. The concern here is motivation. If I'm not saved by my works, then why work at all? If I'm not saved by the law, well then why keep the law? If I'm not saved by what I do, well then why do anything? You've got to admit, grace can be a little risky. There's a chance that people will take it to the extreme. There's the possibility that people will abuse God's goodness. And a word about that Sears card here might be helpful. I have a simple rule about credit cards. Own as few as possible and pay them off as soon as you can. I don't like paying interest to a bank because I get so little from the bank anyway. So if it's at all possible, I try to pay the balance in full at the end of each month. So you can imagine my kids' surprise when my wife and I put a credit card in their hand the day that they left for college. Standing in the driveway with the car packed and the farewells having been said, we handed it to them. Our only instructions were, be careful with how you use it. That's pretty risky, don't you think? And as they're driving away to college, it probably occurred to them that they were now free. They could go anywhere they wanted. They had wheels and a tank of gas. They had their clothes. They had money in their pocket and the stereo in their trunk. And most of all, they had a credit card. The shackles are now off, right? They could have been in Mexico by nightfall if they wanted to. 
So what was to keep the children from going wild with their freedom? That's the question that was being asked by the pragmatist. What's to keep us from going wild with God's grace? If worshiping doesn't save me, then why worship? If giving doesn't save me, then why give? If my morality doesn't save me, then, I don't know, watch out. Jude warns of that particular attitude when he speaks of people who, quote, abuse his grace as an opportunity for immorality. Jude, verse 4. Later, Paul will counter his critics with one question. So, do you think we should continue sinning so that God will give us even more grace? No, he says, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Or as one translator writes, what a ghastly thought. A ghastly thought? Indeed. Grace promoting evil? Mercy that endorses sin? What a horrible idea. And the Paul uses the strongest Greek idiom possible to repudiate the idea. In Greek, it's meganoito. The phrase literally means, may it never be. As he has already said, God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Someone who sees grace as a permission to sin has missed grace entirely. Mercy understood, on the other hand, is holiness desired. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Paul says, Jesus gave himself for us so he might pay the price to free us from all evil and to make us pure people who belong only to him. People who are always wanting to do good deeds. I want you to note that last phrase. People who are always wanting to do good deeds. You see, grace fosters an eagerness to do good. Grace doesn't spawn some desire to sin, because if one has truly embraced God's gift, he's not going to mock it. In fact, if a person uses God's mercy as a liberty to sin, you kind of wonder whether a person ever knew God's mercy at all. So when we gave the kids their credit card, we didn't attach a list of rules or regulations on how to use it. There was no contract for them to sign or rules for them to read. We didn't make them place their hand on a Bible and swear to reimburse us for all of their expenses. In fact, we didn't ask for any repayment at all. And as things turned out, they went a few weeks into the semester without ever using it. Why would that be? Well, because we gave them more than just a credit card. We gave them our trust. And where they might break our rules, they weren't about to abuse our trust. God's trust makes us eager to do what is right. That's the genius of grace. The law can show us where we do wrong, but it can't make us eager to do what is right. But grace can. Or as Paul answers in Romans chapter 3, verse 31, faith causes us to be what the law truly wants. 
Now, the second objection to grace comes from those who are cautious of anything that's new. Don't give me any of this newfangled teaching. Just give me the law. You know, it was good enough for Abraham, it's good enough for me. And Paul basically says, all right, let me tell you a little bit about Abraham. And he starts in Romans chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. If Abraham was made right by the things he did, then he would have a reason to brag. But this is not God's view, because the scripture says, quote, Abraham believed God, and God accepted Abraham's faith, and that faith made him right with God. And I'm thinking these words must have absolutely stunned the Jewish audience, because Paul is pointing to Abraham as a prototype of grace, not works. The Jews upheld Abraham as a man who was blessed because of obedience. Not the case, argues Paul. The first book in the Bible, Genesis, says that Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it him as righteousness. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. So it was his faith, not his works, which made him right with God. And five times in six separate verses, Paul uses the word credit. Now, the term is common in financing transactions, right? Banking transactions. To credit an account means to make a deposit. So if I credit your account, then I either increase the balance in your account or I lower your debt. Wouldn't it be nice if someone credited your credit card account? I mean, all month long, you rack, rack up the bills. You dread the day that the statement comes in the mail. And then, when it comes, you leave it on the desk or on the counter for a couple days. I guess to marinate. Because you don't want to see how much you owe, right? Finally, you force yourself to open up that envelope. And with one eye closed and the other eye open, you peek at the number. What you read causes the other eye to pop open. A zero balance? Oh, there must be a mistake. So you call the bank that issued your credit card. Yes, the representative explains, your account is paid in full. A person who wishes to remain anonymous sent us a check to cover your debt. You can't believe your ears. Oh, how do you know that that person's check is any good? Oh, there's no doubt about that one. Your benefactor has been paying off people's debts for years. And Jesus would love to do the same. And he can. He has no personal debt at all. And what's more, he's been doing it for years. For proof, Paul reaches into this 2,000-year-old file called Abram of Ur of the Chaldees and pulls out its statement. And the statement has its share of charges. Abram was far from perfect. There were times when he trusted the Egyptians more than he trusted God. There was a time when he lied to the Pharaoh, telling the Pharaoh that his wife was actually his sister. But Abram made one decision that changed his eternal life. He trusted God to set him right instead of trying to be right on his own. Romans chapter 4, verse 3. So here's a man... Paul argues, 
that's been justified by faith before his circumcision, which was a big deal for the Jewish believers, verse 10. He was justified before the law, verse 13. He was justified before even Moses and the Ten Commandments. Here's a man that was justified by faith before the cross. You see, the sin covering blood of Calvary extends as far into the past as it does into the future. And we must not see God's grace as a provision made after the law had failed. Grace was offered before the law was even revealed. Indeed, grace was offered before man was created. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18-20, through 20, You were bought, not with something that ruins like gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, who was like a pure and perfect lamb. Christ was chosen before the world was made. But he was shown to the world in these last days for your sake. Okay, but why, why would God offer grace before we even needed it? I think that's a pretty good question. It's because God doesn't want us to sin, but He knows us. David wrote in Psalm chapter 33, verse 15, He made their hearts and understands everything that they do. In Psalm 103, verse 14, He knows how we are made. And he knew that we would someday need his grace. Grace is nothing new. God's mercy predates Paul and his readers. It precedes David and Abraham. It even predates creation. God's grace, church, is way older than your sin. And it's also way greater than your sin. But that just sounds too good to be true. And that's the third objection. Just as there was the pragmatist who said grace is too risky and the traditionalist who said that grace is like too new, there was the skeptic who said that's just too good to be true. This is by far the most common objection to grace. Questions of a young man who spent maybe a couple university years chasing after the flesh and not chasing after God. A young woman who wonders if God can forgive an abortion that she had 10 years ago. A father who just realized that he devoted his entire life to his work and neglected his own kids, all are wondering if they've overextended their line of credit with God. And they aren't alone. The vast majority of people simply state, well, God may give grace to you, but not to me. You see, I've charted the waters of failure. I've pushed the envelope too many times. I'm not your typical sinner. I'm guilty of blank. And then they fill in the blank. And the question I have for you is, what's your blank? Is there a chapter in your biography that condemns you? Is there a valley in your heart that's too deep for the firstborn son to ever reach? If you think there's no hope, <laughs> then Paul has a person that he desperately wants you to meet. Our barren past reminds the apostle of Sarah's barren womb. Now, God had promised Sarah and Abram a child. In fact, the name Abram means exalted father. But God changed Abram's name 
to Abraham, which means father of many. And by the time Abram has his name changed to Abraham, he still has no son. Forty, four, zero, forty years pass before that promise from God was ever honored. Don't you think the conversation became dreadfully routine for Abraham? Oh, what's your name? Abraham? Oh, father of many. What a great name. Tell me, how many sons do you have? And Abraham would just sigh and answer, none. God had promised a child, but Abraham had no son. He left his home for an unknown country, but no son was born to him. He overcame famine, but still didn't have a son. His nephew, Lot, came and lived with him and then left. And even then, he still had no son. He would have encounters with angels. He'd have an encounter with Melchizedek, but still without an heir. By now, Abraham is 99 years old. Sarah is not much younger. She knitted while he's playing solitaire, and both are chuckling at the thought of having a bouncing baby boy on their knee. He lost his hair, she lost her teeth, and neither spent any time lusting after the other. But somehow, They never lost hope. Occasionally, he'd think of God's promise and maybe give her a wink. And she'd give him a smile and think, well, God did promise a child, didn't he? When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he could not do, but on what God said he would do. Abraham didn't focus on his impotence and say, it's hopeless. This hundred-year-old body could never, ever father a child. Nor did he survey Sarah's decades of infertility and give up. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise cautiously asking all these skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise of God and came up strong. He came up ready for God to act. That's why it said in Romans chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, Abraham was declared fit before God by trusting God to set him right. Church, at this point in time for Abraham, everything is gone. No youth, no vigor, no strength. The get up and go had gotten up and went. And all old Abe and Sarah had was a social security check and a promise from heaven. But Abraham decided to trust the promise rather than focusing on his problems. And as a result, the Medicare couple was the first to bring a crib into the nursing home. I want you to ask yourselves, do we have much more than Abraham and Sarah? No, not exactly. I mean, there's not one of us that hasn't racked up more bills than we could ever pay. But there's not one of us who has to remain in debt. The same God who gave a child to Abraham has promised grace 
to us as well. So what's more incredible? Sarah telling Abraham that he's a daddy? Or God calling you and me righteous? Both are pretty absurd. Both seem too good to be true. But both are from God, who through His Son, Jesus Christ, unrack-racked the dead. This week, church, would you please live in God's grace? So many of us feel like we have done something in our past for which God can never forgive. And that is a lie from Satan himself. God came up with the idea of grace through his son Jesus Christ before the creation of the world. Do you not think that God intended that grace to extend to you? Or do you think that maybe you're just the exception to the rule? You have this blank that you fill in that is worse than anybody else's blank. Paul, the apostle who we've been talking about today, he said, look, I am the chief of sinners. And I don't know a whole lot about Paul's life other than what we can read. But one thing I do know is that before Paul was named Paul, He was Saul, and he came from a city called Tarsus, and he sat on the Jewish Sanhedrin, and he was absolutely convinced that Christians were going to be the ruin of the Jewish religion. And so Paul, with letters of authority from the Sanhedrin, which is like their supreme court, had the authority to take people into custody and have them killed if convicted of Christianity, he sat there and watched as Stephen was being stoned to death because he was a Christian. And Paul was even hanging on to the coats of those who were doing the stoning. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. And yet he writes the book of Romans. Have you killed any Christians lately? I don't think so. But even though you might think your sin is worse than something like that, Paul is writing to you from his own experience as given to him by God through the Holy Spirit that you are not beyond God's help. Accept His grace. And to do that, you need to have faith in God through his son, Jesus Christ, just like Abraham. So this week, church, live grace-filled. Have a new chapter on life. The clock has now moved ahead. You have more time in the evening to go about your day. I'm kind of like Neil. I'm not exactly sure why we're saving any time because we still have just the 24 hours. But as I understand the history of it, the idea was that for people largely in an agrarian society had more daylight to work their fields and harvest their crops. Maybe so. There's been times when we've had a national fervor to change this daylight savings time and just say, look, enough is enough. Just set the clock and let it be that way forever. The problem is is that although many states have taken that action, they can't do it on their own without the approval of the federal government, and the federal government just dawdles about taking any action. Why, I don't know. That's politics. Here's what I do know. All of you are here today to worship a God who loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you. He wants to extend you that grace. All you have to do is accept it. There are things that God wants us to do in terms of demonstrating the acceptance of that faith. 
obviously confessing his son Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, being baptized into his death, to being raised in newness of life, to walk differently, to act differently, to behave differently, to be sin-free? No. We're still going to make mistakes. But those mistakes are capable of being forgiven because of God's grace. So if you've written out any prayer requests that you want to have discussed at the close of services, we'll do that. You can hand them up as Steve leads us in this closing song. At the conclusion of that song, we'll read any prayer requests that you might have. We'll pray about them, and then we'll be dismissed. We're going to stand and sing, Jesus paid it all, because he did. Let's stand, please.